Hello and welcome to today's iCentd Connector webinar. My name is Marianne Comparet and I'm speaking from the International Society for Neglected Tropical Diseases. Um, we're thrilled today to be tackling um, uh, discussions and having a great presentation about yet another highly neglected disease, uh, in fact a zoonotic disease um, in this case. And we will be talking today about cystic echinococcosis with a focus in the Eastern Mediterranean region. And uh, it's equally our pleasure today to welcome Professor Majid Fasihi Harandi, um, who is Director um, of the Research Center for Hydatid Disease in Iran, um, and is also a Professor of Molecular Parasitology at the School of Medicine um, of the Kerman University of Medical Sciences, also in Iran. Um, so, Professor Harandi, a very warm welcome to today's ICNTD Connect webinar. Um, I hope you are well. Thank you. Thank you very much, Marion, and thank you so much for having me and let me talk about the cystic echinococcosis. It's our pleasure and uh, one of the reasons that we thought it would be great to talk about this today was that recently you um, co-authored a paper which uh, was published in PLOS NTDs and really focusing on the fact that cystic echinococcosis uh, is prevalent in the Eastern Mediterranean region and yet remains highly neglected. So uh, we'd love to hear more about your research and your thoughts on this. And hopefully after your presentation, this will open up to um, a lively Q&A and discussion. Uh, we have a lot of uh, veterinarians in our audience today. Uh, and again, a very international um, audience. So to our attendees, a uh, very warm uh, hello. And Professor Harandi, I will hand over now to you and for your presentation. And I look forward to having some discussions following this in a few moments. Okay. Thank you and good time to everybody. Good evening, good afternoon, good morning, everybody. Uh, let me start. Uh, as Marian pointed out, I'm going to talk about cystic echinococcosis with a special uh, emphasis on the Eastern Mediterranean region. So, what, have, what I'm going to talk about is the first, what is cystic echinococcosis? Where is the Eastern Mediterranean region? Why CE is prevailing in the region and why it is neglected? So let's start with the disease first. Uh, echinococcosis is actually two different diseases with very similar life cycle and biology. Uh, one of them causes a fatal infection, but more or less rare in the region and uh, all over the board. It's called alveolar echinococcosis caused by the echinococcus uh, multilacularis. It's mostly uh, cycled between rodents at intermediate hosts and foxes and other carnivores as the definitive host. But one of the other forms of uh, echinococcosis, which, are, which uh, I am going to talk about today, is cystic echinococcosis, which is very far more widespread than um, alveolar echinococcosis. It has a domestic life cycle between dogs and livestock, domestic uh, animals like sheep, goat, cattle, camel, pig, and white angulates. And uh, as you see here, uh, the definitive host uh, is a carnivore and a small tapeworm called Echinococcus granulosus lives in the small intestine of dogs. And when dog defecate, the eggs of the parasite uh, dispersing the environment and it could infect uh, people as well as the animals. The result is a cystic mass, a cystic lesion in the viscera of the uh, intermediate host, which is mostly in liver 
and long and uh, virtually every organ you think about it in the brain, in spleen, in bones, breasts, endocrine system, the heart, and virtually every site of the body could be involved in the disease. Uh, as you see here, a cystic lesion, you, you can see several cystic lesion on the liver and lungs of this uh, sheep organs. Uh, the same is uh, happened in human as well. So you can see here a human spleen with a huge cyst we have recently collected in our medical center, Afzalipur Medical Center. And this is a for cattle, a cystic lesion, several cystic lesion in cattle or in the liver. Okay, as you can see here, uh, it's uh, a real zoonosis with uh, carnivores, domestic and wild carnivores as, as the definitive hosts and several species of domestic and wild uh, angulates as the uh, intermediate hosts. So it's a zoonosis and uh, we are talking about this zoonosis as a neglected disease. Regarding the significance of cystic echinococcosis, you know, C is assumed to be a human and veterinary public health problem, but there are very limited data for uh, the global burden of disease uh, and the socio-economic impact of the disease is not fully understood in the region and in many other endemic areas in the world. Uh, for example, in the Eastern Mediterranean region, uh, a couple of studies have been carried out, one of them in Iran, as you see here, and it's estimated that the monetary burden of the disease only in Iran is more than 200 million dollars every year. So it's a huge burden on the society. Uh, according to WHO, uh, it's estimated that more than 1 million people are suffering or affected with the disease in any one time. Mostly the disease is uh, prevalent in rural areas, but uh, we could see the disease in uh, urban areas as well. Many of our patients and patients around the region are from urban areas. And uh, the cost is estimated at three billion dollars annually. So let's have uh, a brief talk about the region. Where is the Eastern Mediterranean region? As you see, this region is uh, consisted of 22 countries, uh, mostly in the Middle East and North Africa. It's sometimes called MENA region, Middle East and North Africa, from Pakistan and Afghanistan in the east to Morocco in the westernmost side of the region. So uh, about more than 600 uh, million people living in this region. WHO has six regional offices around the world and one of the uh, regional offices in WHO is the uh, Eastern Mediterranean region. It's called EMRO, Eastern Mediterranean Regional Office. As you see here, it's uh, the same area as I have shown to you in the previous slide. Regarding the climate, it's a, a variety of climate could be uh, seen in the region from a well warm desert climate to the humid Mediterranean climate here, yellow areas, and to the temperate uh, continental climate in the uh, northern parts of the region. This is the distribution of the disease around the world. You can see the heavy green areas, which is the uh, areas where 
cystic echinococcosis is highly endemic. As you see, all of the um, Eastern Mediterranean region are highly endemic uh, areas for cystic echinococcosis. And uh, for the white ones, I think there is no uh, data. If we go through the populations here, we can find the disease here as well. So another disease, uh, alveolar echinococcus, is caused by echinococcus multilocularis. You can see here, both disease in some area, both diseases are occurred. In, uh, in China mostly, in Central Asia, in Northern Iran and Turkey. So one of the most important hotspots of the disease is uh, Eastern Mediterranean region here. Uh, it also affects Southern Europe and also Sub-Saharan African countries. In South America, especially in Argentina, parts of Brazil, Uruguay, Chile, Peru, uh, it is a prevalent uh, and endemic disease. So it has a global distribution in the world. Uh, the question is why cystic echinococcosis is prevailing in the Eastern Mediterranean region? So our uh, third question, and one of the most important questions, is why uh, the disease is so endemic and so prevalent here in this region. One of the uh, causes of this is the geography and the ancient civilizations in the region. If you see to the Eastern Mediterranean region, first uh, people, who domesticated animals, for example, sheep, cattle, goats, pig, in the, on the earth, uh, are people living in the Mediterranean basin. According to uh, a paper published by Melinda Zeder in PNAS, as you can see here, uh, the first domestication occurred in this region, in the so-called a fertile crescent. About 11,000 years ago, people domesticated goats and pigs and cattle and sheep here in the um, Eastern Mediterranean region, in Iran, in Mesopotamia, in Iraq, in Syria, Southern Turkey, Lebanon, Egypt, Palestine, and uh, Jordan and other countries. So the Fertile Crescent is the cradle of a domestic uh, transmission of the disease from more than 10,000 years ago. But we know the wide uh, transmission, the sylvatic transmission of the disease has occurred several uh, million years for, I think so. Okay. <clears throat> Another uh, answer to this question uh, is the diverse intermediate host species in the region. So it's estimated that more than 13 different intermediate host species uh, could be infected in the region. Uh, all kinds of livestock from sheep, goat, cattle to buffalo, horse, donkey, uh, camel, and uh, both one hand, two hand camel, uh, pigs, and uh, several species of wild uh, angulates could be infected in the region. Uh, no region on the world has so diverse intermediate host uh, species. So this, that's why we could see the transmission of the disease here. We know that the cystic echinococcosis is transmitting to all 22 countries in the region, all 22 countries. But uh, for sure, the most important intermediate hosts are sheep, goat, and camels, and to a little extent, cattle 
and pigs as well. But the most uh, important ones are three animals, sheep, goat, and camels in the region. Another important issue is the availability of intermediate host offal to dogs. If you have a look on the cycle, cystic echinococcus cycle, you can see uh, that uh, dogs have to be infected with the parasite through ingesting viscera of the intermediate hosts, which is the uh, sheep and goats' livers, lungs, and other organs. And the dogs have to be... Uh, and the, or, the viscera organs have to be available to the dogs as well. So, when we look in the region, we can see uh, many avatars which are not so uh, standard. Uh, many avatars are substandard avatars and the offal could be uh, available to the free roaming dogs we can find uh, free roaming dogs many many uh, uh, animals around the avatar around the slaughterhouses in the region like uh, many endemic areas in the world Another issue is home slaughter and illegal abattoirs, uh, because uh, most countries of the region have uh, veterinary inspectors in the official abattoirs. But the problem is, in several countries, uh, people practice home slaughter in rural areas, and there are uh, illegal and official and regulated abattoirs in uh, the cities which uh, they have uh, no veterinary inspection and so the viscera of the infected uh, livestock uh, will be available to dogs in the region as you see here for example uh, the animals kept here and then uh, slaughtered and the infected organ will be disposed here and uh, dogs are around and could be uh, could eat the uh, viscera as you see here it's uh, another one uh, and dogs are waiting for the viscera on the afternoon to ingest and infect it with the parasite Another uh, issue is free roaming dog population is the big issue and uh, as you know in many uh, developing countries it's a problem free roaming dogs with no uh, checkups and they are roaming freely in the cities and in the rural areas and many of them are infected with the parasite and excreting the eggs through their feces. So this is a major issue which facilitates the transmission of the disease. As you see here in the cities and in uh, rural areas, the free roaming dogs are everywhere and people could be infected even in the uh, urban areas. And uh, there is a task for us for veterinarian for public health officials to do something about dog population management uh, and we have good guidelines here we have to observe these guidelines for example this ICAM guideline about humane dog population management guidance uh, it's uh, theoretically possible but in action it's very hard to do in many endemic areas Another issue which uh, could facilitate the transmission of the disease in the region is uh, many social cultural events that intens intensify the uh, cystic echinococcus transmission in the region. For example, in social events like weddings, like uh, funeral services, like 
mourning religious uh, uh, ceremonies and uh, in mass gathering of Hajj also in Eid al-Adha uh, which is an important uh, festival in many Muslim countries in the region uh, several thousands, several hundred thousands of uh, livestock will be slaughtered and uh, many of them in uh, unregulated uh, slaughterhouses or at home. So this is a major issue in the transmission of the disease. Another issue is the close human dog uh, relationship. Uh, so dogs is the oldest friend of a human uh, from more than 15,000 years ago. So uh, this close contact could facilitate the uh, transmission. As you see here, it could be a professional contact. For example, this uh, herd, shepherd, with the herd dog, with sheep dogs, and also people, especially children, have a close contact with dog and they could be infected and the thing is uh, the incubation period of the disease is uh, a little bit long maybe years so children could be infected right now and develop the cyst several years later another issue is food habits uh, in the mediterranean region people uh, prefer to use uh, fresh, natural uh, vegetable products and this make them uh, more susceptible to the uh, transmission. Raw vegetable consumption in the region is very high. For example, as you see to, in, to uh, FAO, FAO data, as you see uh, this the yellow one is the average world consumption per capita consumption of vegetables and the other three uh, columns are for Egypt, uh, Iran and Turkey. As you see, uh, they consume a uh, high uh, amount of raw vegetables in their diet. And uh, if we look at the agricultural system, you see that the the farming system is very open and dogs could access the farms and crops and uh, the crops could be infected and when people use fresh unwashed vegetables they could be infected. Uh, in addition to the traditional uh, agricultural system we have traditional animal husbandry system in many areas there are nomadic people uh, with animals, especially dogs and sheep around them, living with them and transferring them, traveling around the country. Uh, echinococcus in the wildlife is uh, really important. You know, uh, the disease could be uh, perpetuate in the wildlife between wolves and uh, uh, wild angulates and uh, the reports indicate that the sylvatic transmission of the disease uh, has been occurring in uh, every country that they research. Another issue is the different genotypes. This region is also very rich in the genotypes, different genotypes of echinococcus. As you see, there are 10 genotypes, G1 to G10, and most countries have uh, several genotypes in each country. We could see in Iran, Iraq, Jordan, Oman. Many countries have no record because, for example, in the Arabian Peninsula, we have uh, not enough data uh, more and more data are coming in, but uh, we need more research and more data from these countries in the Arabian Peninsula, from Afghanistan, from Pakistan, uh, and um, 
Lebanon, Jordan, we have no recent data on echinococcosis from here because it's just a neglected uh, area of research. So you can see, if we have to control the disease, we have to uh, cut the cycle in different sites. For example, uh, we have to correct our slaughterhouses, we have to control home slaughter, we have to control feeding dogs with viscera and improving our slaughter hygiene, uh, culling eight sheep, sheep vaccination with EG95 vaccine and uh, educational campaigns, uh, multidisciplinary activities uh, are needed to control the disease. That's why the disease control, CE control, is very complex. So the final question is uh, why CE is neglected? Uh, one of the main reasons is the global burden of all disease. If you see here, uh, this is from IHME Global Burden of Disease. The blue area are non-communicable diseases. These are the physical damage and accidents and other uh, causes of death. And this area is the uh, infectious and communicable and neonatal diseases. As you see here, at the global scale, this area is a little bit smaller than other areas, and the neglected diseases are here in this small uh, box. So 17 diseases are in this small box here. It's at the global scale. If you see for example, uh, Sub-Saharan Africa, you see here, the communicable disease is so bigger than other uh, boxes here. Uh, and that's why the disease are neglected. Here, for example, in a country in, at the global scale, and this is it, the Sub-Saharan African country, if you compare these two boxes, you see that the most uh, research, most found, most attention are towards the non-communicable diseases and big three here. Big three means HIV, malaria, and tuberculosis. If you see here, the big three of uh, infectious diseases, communicable diseases are HIV AIDS, malaria, and tuberculosis, TB. So this is one uh, possible explanation of the uh, neglected situation of this kind of diseases here. Why CE is neglected? One of the most uh, important uh, uh, causes of the neglect is lack of information and awareness about the extent of the problem. We really don't know of the disease in many endemic areas in the world. In many MRO countries, little is known about C epidemiology and transmission. In many of them, recent data are not yeah. available. There are limited data for estimating the global burden of CE. And uh, the result is the is socioeconomic impact of C is not fully understood. We could explain the uh, neglected situation of disease at three levels, at the global level, at the national level, and at the community level. At the global level, as you know, neglected tropical diseases do not travel easily, and thus they don't pose an immediate threat to the rest of the world. It's uh, one important uh, cause. They are tied to a specific ecological, geographical, and environmental condition, as you see in the Eastern Mediterranean. The ecology of the region is uh, very suitable for disease transmission. 
And uh, the third is the development of new diagnostic and preventive tools has been underfunded just because they do not represent a significant market. So many pharmaceutical industries uh, could, uh, cannot invest on this disease just because uh, it has not uh, revolved because uh, it do not represent a significant market. Just compare it with cancers, with cardiovascular diseases and so on. At the national level, the cystic echinococcosis and other neglected uh, tropical diseases tend to be hidden below the radar screens of uh, health services and politicians just because they afflict mainly populations that uh, are marginalized with little political voice. It's mainly a rural disease and uh, the marginalized society have no voice to uh, do something about it. The disease are generally not major killers, it's another issue. They cause uh, chronic diseases, although frequently causing severe pain and life uh, lung disabilities, but they generally are not a major killers in the endemic airway. And finally, under resource limited conditions, high mortality diseases such as HIV or tuberculosis are prioritized over this kind of disease. And at the community level, uh, echinococcosis, leishmaniasis, and uh, other parasitic diseases are sometimes the source of a strong social stigma and prejudice. So as a result, these uh, diseases are often out of sight and poorly documented and, and mentioned, and this is the worse the situation. Another cause of the neglect is the, the overlapping situation of uh, neglected zoonotic, zoonotic diseases, for example, cystic echinococcosis. They are somewhere in between medical and veterinary disciplines. Uh, Overlapping situations regarding control between veterinary responsibility and medical needs is a serious issue. Uh, NZDs affect both humans and animals, and intervention required concerted action between veterinary, livestock, and human health sector. And this is very difficult to organize. And that's why the control program uh, will not be well organized in the uh, endemic area. Generating indecision, this generate indecision uh, as to which sector should take responsibility of the disease. Veterinary system, agriculture system, or uh, public health system. And the disease and the people stranded uh, between these uh, uh, sectors uh, among uh, public health, veterinary, agricultural uh, sectors. So if you see uh, that the main driving force is influencing CE transmission, there are a multitude of uh, factors, multitude of institutions involved in the disease uh, control. Uh, medical and veterinary schools, community health centers, public and private hospitals, registry and surveillance system, national and local media, uh, continuous medical education for healthcare professionals, national veterinary organization in endemic areas, Ministry of Agriculture, uh, Department of Environment, abattoirs, municipalities, geographic information systems, and uh, Ministry of Health, uh, local and provincial authorities, municipalities, and others. You see, concerted action among all these is very, very hard. That's why the control uh, has not happened yet in the region. And the other problem is funding. The, if you see here, uh, the big three uh, disease, infectious diseases, malaria, TB, and HIV, 
are on the center of funding in the central zone. And the middle zone is leishmaniasis, trypanosomiasis, dengue, trachoma, schistosomiasis. And if you see here, the outermost ring, mostly zoonotic diseases, including echinococcosis, rabies, brucellosis, anthrax, leptospirosis, cysticercosis, foodborne traumatodiasis, yellow fever, gruli ulcer. And these uh, zoonotic diseases get the least funds for research, for control, and this is another uh, way of neglect. You see here, uh, the funds uh, available for echinococcosis, for example, is the least among the other neglected uh, zoonoses, neglected parasitic diseases. For example, rabies, trypanosomiasis, leishmaniasis, anthrax uh, are, have higher funds. So as you see, uh, echinococcosis is a super neglected disease. It's a neglected, neglected tropical disease. It's highly neglected disease. And uh, the interesting thing is uh, we could control these diseases at a cost-effective level. Uh, different uh, studies showed, for example, for echinococcosis, for every DALI, we could spend 10 to $12 to every DALI averted. So it could, uh, the disease could be controlled with a, a moderate investment in the uh, public health and veterinary sector. Another look on the disease distribution. And uh, let's have a look on the role of WHO and especially World Health Organization Eastern Mediterranean region. Uh, as you see here, uh, you could see on the website, I got it today, uh, it's health topics from A to Z. And if you see here, you could not find a kind of cucosis in the region. The disease is prevalent in all 22 countries and you cannot find every single word of a kind of cucosis in the uh, website. It's, in, it's bizarre. Uh, you see, you can find here, for example, accidents, anthrax, uh, life expectancy, leishmaniasis, uh, campylobacter, uh, and no mention of this important disease in the region. A kind of cruises, you could not find it. You can find uh, Chagas disease. Chagas disease is there. You know, Chagas disease is prevalent only in the Latin American country. And in Emro, you can find something on Chagas, and you cannot find uh, anything on uh, a kind of cruises. Another instance for this uh, bizarre situation is the recent call for 2020-2021 joint MRO TDR small grant scheme. If you can see, uh, no mention of a kind of cuckoosis, not a single word on this disease in the uh, call for research uh, in this uh, uh, WHO region. Malaria, tuberculosis, and leishmaniasis, and all that. Uh, 17 years ago, the uh, World Health Organization at EMRO uh, published an official uh, statement uh, consisting of eight agenda eight items main challenges in the control of zoonotic diseases in the Eastern Mediterranean region and request the member states to ensure the establishment of an empowered national intersectoral committee charged with responsibility for coordinating and advising and surveillance and control of zoonoses. Assess the national burden of zoonotic diseases, promote active community involvement, 
targeted public information material. Update veterinary public health and health professional education at Kilkola, emphasizing on multisectoral approaches, promote and support multidisciplinary research, and cooperate in the prevention of zoonotic diseases uh, and the exchange of information. But nothing happened since then. And uh, even in the WHO agenda, we could not find uh, not a single uh, uh, action regarding the economic causes. I wonder if this is a neglected disease or ignored. Uh, I refer to dictionary. And uh, as you see here, uh, the differences between neglect and ignore is the when one neglects something one may have forgotten about or not been aware of a critical situation for something. One was supposed to take care of or oversee. When, and when uh, one ignores something, one is actively not paying any attention on purpose. Uh, what we can do, advocacy is very important. We have uh, to reach communities, to talk to people, talk to officials in all related disciplines, talk to patients, teach patients. And science communication is very important. Public health professionals have to be updated about the disease management and control. Uh, I want to thank to my colleagues who organized this piece of work, uh, especially my international colleague, Dr. Samuel Lahmar, uh, Dr. Harun Ahmed, Dr. Mohanad Abdul Hamid, and uh, my good colleague, uh, uh, Dr. Borhani and Dr. Fati, and uh, my great colleagues uh, at the Research Center for High Dietetic Disease in three research groups, uh, Dr. Ibrahim Ipur, Dr. Aftar, uh, Dr. Lashkari Zadeh, my good friends, uh, Mr. Nasibi, Ali Muhammadi, Ali Darakhshani, and uh, Ms. Rawai, and all other people at the KMU Department of Parasitology and Vice Chancellor for Research and Technology, and all the PhD MSC, MSc students who are working on and it is thank you for uh, your attention and i will hand over to you marie thank you well thank you very much professor harandi you've uh, given us a really fantastic introduction overview and also a very detailed um uh, it, analysis of where the challenges and the next steps for um, the control and the understanding of cystic echinococcus is, um, is. So thank you so much for that. Um, it was very interesting that you reminded us of um, the importance of our behaviors with uh, animals that we often love and also um, uh, eating habits, um, the, the, your data on fresh food consumption certainly is, um, uh, you know, was really enlightening. I, I never quite realized that, uh, that there was such a variation in our diets and so forth. And um, very interesting as well that you pointed out to those slight inconsistencies within WHO. Um, although on the plus side, uh, I have to say that the Department of NTDs, so perhaps not the regional office, but certainly um, at the NTDs department level, there have there has been uh, a lot of highlighting of echinococcosis. Um, I think their fact sheet was updated quite recently in March and also a few articles re published even as recently as the beginning of June about the situation in Mongolia, Kyrgyzstan um, and China and so forth. So, um, as you say, very important to highlight uh, the neglect, uh, even within international institutions that that was fantastic so thank you so much for that professor um, you're welcome i'm ready for any questions or comments or remarks from the audience well absolutely um you've had a few questions while you were giving your uh, presentation and perhaps we could start off um 
with a question from our friend and colleague, um, Stephen Bremer, works in pest control and is tuning in from Canada, if I'm not mistaken. Um, and Stephen was asking, Professor, are there any studies on the duration of the incubation period in children? It is important to have this data to follow the size of the population that is affected. Uh, actually, it's a big question. Uh, actually, no study has been done on the exact incubation period of the disease, even in the adults. So, uh, our knowledge on um, pediatric echinococcosis, it's uh, not very much. We don't know. What we do know is the long incubation period, um, mainly more than one year uh, of incubation for the disease to be symptomatic. But you know the symptoms of the disease and the incubation period is very much dependent on the site of infection and the size of the cyst. So, uh, hepatic cysts uh, are uh, more or less longer incubation period, have more or less longer incubation period, and maybe the eye infection or brain cysts or uh, endocrine system infections cyst in the pancreas, in the parotid gland, uh, has a much lesser incubation period. But we have children patients, and uh, for example, here in our center, in our province, we have uh, children patients less than one year of old in Iran. So, uh, we don't know exactly uh, the behavior of the parasite and uh, especially in the chief. I hope I could uh, highlight the answer. Of course, absolutely. Um, so a lot of data gaps remaining there. Um, another question, yeah. Professor, um, from Dr. Joaquin Prada, who is, um, I believe, joining us from the University of Surrey here in the UK. And uh, Joaquin was asking, uh, Professor Harandi, could you please comment on the challenges for a control program when you have nomadic or semi-nomadic populations? Could that lead to long distance spreads? Yeah, uh, nomadic uh, people, uh, it, uh, cystic echinococcus is mainly a nomadic uh, disease because nomadic people are living with their animals, with their dogs, and traveling around the countries, even international borders. So the disease could be uh, transferred between the borders, between the provinces, and uh, this is a major issue. Uh, a good control program have to be to deal with this problem. Uh, we need a well organized surveillance system for uh, veterinary and public health, both of them. So that's why an integrated uh, public health and veterinary public health system are needed for the effective control of the disease in every endemic country. And this is a major challenge. Absolutely. Uh, as in many of the neglected diseases, and that was very useful how you yeah. showed so many parallels um, between cystic echinococcosis and most of the NTDs. Um, another question, yeah. Professor, and before I state the question, uh, just to our attendees, mm -hmm. um, if you too would like to ask a question, just a reminder that this is being done through the um, chat function. So if you're on a desktop, I believe that would be on your right. Uh, or on a mobile device, it's um, below this screen. So please feel free to uh, type in your questions and also let us know which university or organization or country you're tuning in from. Uh, it's very interesting to share that information. Um, so back to the questions, Professor, from Ashkan Faridi. Hi, Professor Harandi. Um, please give us some advice on how we could control free roaming dogs in society. Uh, as I said before in my presentation, 
uh, controlling free roaming dogs uh, is a multi-sectoral action. So many sectors, including uh, the media, municipality, the people, NGOs, and public health sectors, veterinary sector, have to be uh, involved in the concerted action towards free roaming dog population. Uh, it's very important because uh, we could control rabies and echinococcosis and in some degree brucellosis even uh, by free roaming dog population management. So it's, just, it's not just for cystic echinococcosis. So under one health approach, we could organize actions towards uh, free roaming dog population, but it's a complex matter. Uh, we, we are doing some uh, activities here in Kerman and uh, we are facing some major challenges to concert uh, different sectors involving this issue. It has ethical issues on how to manage dogs. It has uh, uh, executive issues and some data issues because we have we don't know even the dynamics of dog population in the uh, cities, in the rural area. So we have to do in-depth studies on dog population uh, dynamics and uh, organize uh, most effective uh, programs to control dog population. And uh, building on that, Professor, um, Amadou Jallo was um, saying, may I say a big thank you for the important presentation. Uh, Amadou is tuning in from the Gambia and writes, um, this is to let you know that Africa and particularly the West Africa where I come from, uh, we are at a great risk because we have a large population of stray dogs and a high level of engagement in gardening for vegetables that are usually consumed very fresh all over the country and especially in hotels where we have tourists, um, which is exactly what you were highlighting in your presentation as well, Professor. So Amadou was asking, what is the best advice since the WHO seems to ignore this disease? And Amadou signs off as a WHO TDR fellow uh, at the Royal Veterinary College here in London. Okay, that's, that's exactly right. And that's why recently in Europe, we faced um, an emergent uh, cystic echinococcosis uh, mass of patients regarding the refugee crisis in recent years, people coming from uh, countries in the Eastern Mediterranean to the European countries and also tourists who uh, back from the tropical Africa and uh, tourist destinations in the Middle East, they got infection as well in Germany, in Italy, in France, and uh, in Australia, and other countries. So this is a travel medicine uh, issue as well. And perhaps um, a small opportunity to as well engage new partners uh, on this on this angle, so travel medicine and making the awareness in non-endemic countries of um, this neglected condition. Yes, exactly. Um, Professor, you were mentioning some of your uh, campaigns or activities under One Health umbrella. And as part of our attendees today, we have Dr. Francis Inangoletolaki. Francis is a public health veterinarian from Uganda, uh, who writes here, uh, reminds us that he also had a publication in 2007 in the Journal of Animal Production entitled Distribution and Intensity of Echinococcus Granulosis Infections in the Dog Population of Moroto District, Uganda. So Francis, uh, who has really enjoyed your presentation, was thanking you for this. I uh, was just Thank wondering, um, sure, and was wondering, uh, he himself agrees that the One Health approach would be a very promising solution to this difficult public health problem in pastoral production systems. 
and uh, you've given us some food for thought there on what you would see as applying the One Health approach to this disease. But what might be uh, some more of your thoughts on on this approach? Uh, excuse me, if I uh, read uh, the comment exactly, sorry. Sure. Uh, I have. Sorry. I've just put it up on screen, Professor. Yeah, I didn't understand that if I scroll down and up, you will be scrolled as well. Yeah, uh, it doesn't change the it doesn't change my view of the chat. So you can scroll oh. away. No problem. Okay. <laughs> yeah. I have uh, often thought that One Health uh, could be a promising solution to this difficult public health problem in pastoral production system. Yeah, did, I think the uh, key issue is One Health. We cannot organize a program uh, with one disease, one uh, issue. Uh, we have to have uh, an approach, One Health approach and uh, organize uh, an orchestra of the actions between the veterinary, uh, public health, media, and uh, all officials and uh, political willingness to do something about these diseases. We have to merge actions, for example, uh, good uh, experience, as Marion pointed out, in Mongolia, uh, just to integrate brucellosis and uh, cystic echinococcosis control mm -hmm. in Mongolia. And we can uh, see in Mongolia uh, and WHO site recently emerged, uh, as Marion said, uh, and a good experience of One Health approach in Mongolia. It, uh, the key issue is the political willingness and the intersectoral cooperation. It's very important. The overlapping situation is uh, very uh, crucial. And the disease just, uh, as I said, is stranded between those uh, sectors. It's very hard to manage. Of course, uh, absolutely. And uh, in the same way that you saw uh, cystic echinococcosis was omitted on some important documents at WHO EMRO and I'm sure we can rectify this after this uh, webinar, I hope, um, that these issues have been highlighted. But do you also find that within kind of the very active One Health movement, uh, this disease also perhaps is a little bit neglected or do you find that the, the One Health uh, partnerships and ecosystems are well aware of the burden of cystic echinococcosis. Pardon, your voice uh, was a little bit noisy. Would you please uh, pardon? Yeah, sorry. I'm so sorry about that. Sorry. I was just wondering if um, you felt that cystic echinococcosis was sufficiently represented within One Health movements. Oh, I don't think so. Even in One Health movement, I think uh, major diseases like rabies uh, and brucellosis are far more bolder than cystic echinococcosis. Mm -hmm. You know, people who are actively involving in this disease uh, are not uh, uh, very much in the region, in the all over the world. So we need to educate people, educate our students, teach and involve our people to be involved in this disease, to know about the disease, and that's why science communication is so important in this regard. Sure. Uh, yeah. Of course. Just moving on uh, to a different topic. Um, two questions here, Professor, um, about uh, vaccination. So, first of all, uh, Madi Borhani asks, um, says, firstly, thank you very much for the excellent presentation, Professor Majid. Um, how can uh, how can it how can we control and prevent CE and EMRO countries? 
um, and specifically, what about the logistics problems of the 95 vaccine? I think that's the EG95 vaccine, and particularly the price of this vaccine. And this also ties into a, a related question um, that Maddie also asked, which was, um, how can we use the EG95 vaccine to control and prevent uh, CE and EMRO countries? So, uh, we are very lucky to have a vaccine, to, to have a vaccine to uh, prevent the disease. So, the control of the disease involves two main actions. One, drug dosing at the regular intervals, at least four to eight times a year. And the second is the livestock vaccination with EG95 vaccine. So we have the vaccine, but mm, it's not commercialized or very poorly commercialized in the world. As, I, as far as I know, it is commercializing in China recently and in Argentina, and that's it. And uh, we need to uh, invest on this vaccine, which is developed by Professor Marshall Light Oilers in the University of uh, Melbourne in Australia. And we thank you him for all his efforts in developing the vaccine. But, uh, okay, sorry, I am concerning on the time as well. Well, um, do you have time, Professor, for one or two more questions? Or yes, do, you, for sure. do you need to go? I'm open. You're open. Okay, that's brilliant. Um, we're just coming to the end in any case of our webinar, but just to round off with one or two more uh, questions from our attendees. So, first of all, a great comment here from uh, Shumanta Parida. Uh, Shumanta is reminding us that there are specific calls from the European Commission and EDCTP for NTD calls, which should also be tapped for echinococcosis. And also, perhaps as a reminder as well, um, to uh, Amadou Jallo, who was uh, talking to us earlier on about uh, West Africa, if I can all remind you that a few weeks ago, we had, in fact, a webinar, an ICENTD Connect, from the team at Ascend, who are funding uh, projects. So this would be specifically for West and Central Africa. Professor Majid, so not Eastern European region, not yet, but Amadou, perhaps this might be of interest to you and other colleagues in the region. So do look that up on our uh, YouTube channel. There's a recording of the webinar and lots of information there. Um, and on the subject of partnerships, Amadou was also asking, would you be prepared to work with the Gambian authorities to work on a research, to work on research on the disease uh, with the involvement of the Ministry of Health and the Department of Livestock Services. So quite a lot of open uh, invitations and uh, suggestions there for possible partnerships. Yeah, uh, thank you all. And we are ready to collaborate. We are all colleagues interested in research and doing something about echinococcosis. Uh, in the region and beyond, in Africa especially. And uh, I would say that in Africa, I think, the Afro region of WHO it is much more uh, interested in a kind of cocosis than uh, Eastern Mediterranean region. It's uh, uh, disappointing, I think, for EMRO. That's very interesting, and I'm sure there's a, a very, you know, good reason behind this. Uh, perhaps just in the way that uh, the WHO has divided up the diseases amongst themselves. I know perhaps the perception is that this falls under the umbrella of the NTD department at Geneva, or who knows. But um, uh, we will watch this space. Hopefully, um, all these things will be readjusted. Um, yeah. So just to round off with a couple questions, Professor, here, Eran Devere is asking, uh, uh, just quite a specific question, but is the, are there differences in the virulence, mainly to humans, of different genotypes of the disease? Yes, for sure. Um, until uh, to the new millennium, 
Echinococcus granulosus was considered as one single species. But uh, in recent 20, 25 years, it's uh, being clear that the parasite is actually a complex of species and genotypes with different pathogenicity and virulence. So we now have uh, Echinococcus sensolato as a complex species, which is consisted uh, in at least seven species. Uh, for example, we have Echinococcus equinus, which infects uh, donkeys and horses and other equids. And this species could not infect human. Uh, so sheep and human are pretty much resistant to this infection with this uh, parasite, this genotype. But uh, Echinococcus, senso, Echinococcus granulosus senso stricto or Echinococcus canadensis or Echinococcus intermedius are those species with high infectivity to the uh, human populations. So yeah, it's a very important issue and one of the research gaps in the world is to clarify which genotype is perpetuated in which region. We have to know mm -hmm. this before implementing any control program. So, uh, in recent years, many activities have been done, in, especially in the Eastern Mediterranean region, in this regard. But we need more and more data for some countries like Arabian Peninsula, from Jordan, from Lebanon, which have not uh, any recent data about the genotypes. Right, excellent. And um, kind of staying on the regional uh, topic, Emmanuel Agunloye is asking, um, Tenia are prevalent in West Africa and in any way, does this mean that uh, we are also predisposed to echinococci infestations? Uh, you know, the cycle in uh, Tenias is, is a little bit different from echinococcosis. Echinococcosis is a, a parasitic disease perpetuating between dogs and uh, sheep and other livestock. And human is mainly an accidental uh, host for this parasite. But in Tenia, Tenia solium or Tenia saginata, human is the main definitive host of the disease. So uh, we have the uh, adult form living in our intestine, excreting proglutid segments full of eggs throughout the feces and uh, perpetuating and transmitting disease to cattle and pigs. So mm -hmm. it's uh, the epidemiological pattern is a little bit different because in Tenia, the human is in the center of uh, transmission. Interesting, thank you very much. And so to perhaps uh, conclude on this one question, uh, Stephen Bremer is asking again uh, a second question. So some societies eat dog meat and what is the threat to such populations? Pardon? Oh, just put the question up on screen. There we go. Some societies eat dog meat itself and what is the threat to such populations? Generally speaking, dog contact is a risk factor for disease. So those societies eating dog meat uh, could be at a special risk of uh, the disease because they have uh, much contact with dogs. Uh, so it may be uh, an indirect cause of disease, not directly. So nobody could be infected directly by eating dog meat, no. The parasite is not present in dog meat, but the contacting with dogs could be a risk factor because the dog body is covered with eggs. So the people could be infected with dog contact. Mm. Thank you for this clarification. Um, I also just saw 
going back to the funding and collaboration opportunities that uh, Joaquin, who was uh, tuning in from the University of Surrey, was reminding us that they also have a One Health European project funding a PhD in cystic echinococcus. So if any of our attendees or perhaps any of your students, Professor, oh, might be interested in exploring this collaboration. Um, so Joaquin's reminded us of that. Thank you so much. For Great that. news. Thank you, Joaquin. Yeah. And uh, send uh, an email or the link to the audience uh, on the ISNTD website or somewhere else to be aware of the details. Thank you very much. Yes, thank you for sharing that. That's very good news. Uh, excellent opportunity with a really great team there at the University of Surrey. Um, so, Professor, this, I think, brings us to the end of our webinar. I uh, would just like to thank you for this uh, incredibly interesting hour that we've spent with you. Um, I'm pretty sure it's safe to say that cystic echinococcus is slightly less neglected now that you have told us about more about this and of the challenges um, involved. You've had a, a lot of thank yous on the chat for um, your, your presentation from Haroon Ahmed saying excellent presentation. Ali Derakshani, thank you, Professor. Um, we've had uh, Mahanad Abdul Hamid. Uh, thanks, Majid. It is a very excellent presentation. Opeyemi Olasun Kanmi. Thank you for the presentation and many, many more. I can't uh, read them all out here, but a very grateful audience. And same here at ISNTD, Professor. We've been uh, very thankful for your time. Thank you all. Thank you very much for uh, listening and for your kind attention. A special thank you to you, Marion, for organizing this talk. Thank you very much. It's my pleasure. I always learn so much from our speaker and from our audience. So, uh, so from us today, uh, that's all. I hope to we have the opportunity to meet one day, Professor, in person. And uh, thank you for your time Hopefully. today. Hopefully. And uh, let's thank definitely you. keep in touch. Thank you. Thank you all. Yeah. And have a nice time. Take care, everybody. Bye, everybody. See you next week. Bye. Bye.